Thanks, everybody. Well, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Uh, this, mark, this month marks the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots. And to commemorate this historical moment, the New York City Opera has commissioned a brand new opera called Stonewall with music by Ian Bell and libretto by Pulitzer Prize winner Mark Campbell. Let's take a look. Against the wall! Everybody, please put your hands together for Ian Bell and Mark Campbell. Let's hear Thank it. Thank you. Hi there. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my first question for you guys is, uh, obviously you are about to open this Friday. What is it like watching that footage right now, knowing what you have on the stage and the costumes that you have and everything that's going to go into it? Well, that's actually the first time I've seen that. Really? I landed two days ago. Wow. Um, there have been three weeks into rehearsals already. So I'm looking at that going, Oh, I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> that. Yeah, I reckon I can sing along to that one, karaoke time. Uh, like, it just feels amazing to see that. And yeah. I actually walked past the rack of costumes today, full 60s Technicolor. So wow. it's going to feel from the time. It's going to feel from the time. It's, it's, for me, it's very exciting because we kind of sit in our own little rooms and write this story. And, uh, you know, we live in different countries. So we, most of this libretto was created um, by email. I think all of it, really. Most of the opera was created by email. And so to see it realized by our stage director and our brilliant cast is just, it's, it's more exciting than you can imagine. How does that work, doing this over email? Do you send music to him and then you write or vice versa? No, 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 no. A lot of people think that, I'm a librettist, and a lot of people think that, that we come in and fill in words to what the composer has written. The story of an opera starts with the libretto. And so I finished the libretto, handed it to Ian, and then we work back and forth. I would get text messages or emails or something in the middle of the night saying, oh, could I have maybe three more words here? And then he would play me some music, and it generally just made me cry because it was so beautiful. I hate to be asked such a naive question about opera, but starting with the libretto... Most of us are naive about opera. I still am. It's unfortunate, though. It's, a, it's such a beautiful art form. Um, with the libretto and starting there, are you even thinking of melody at all? Or are you just thinking about the story and about almost essentially like dialogue? Would I, I think of melody, mm -hmm. but what I write in my head is far worse and, and really <laughs> terrible compared to what Ian would come up with. I mean, that's why I'm a librettist and not a composer. Right. What kind of what kind of beats are you thinking of? Are you thinking in beats of any kind? Or listen, if if you went into my head, what what beats? What <laughs> it would be like five eight seven eight three two four. I mean, like there's no, I don't. Uh, those were very complex things he just suggested. Yeah, yeah those, those weren't get you kind of normal march and a waltz. Yeah, we can't. <laughs> I never do four four in a libretto. And what is it? How does it work for you? You get the libretto, and then how do you start composing? How do you? So think about I was it? very lucky in that. Mark sent me some like bits piecemeal so I get a bit of a flavor because what was very important in the fashioning of this piece was that we had a cast of really distinct, diverse people who would have all you know, headed down to Stonewall at that time just to be, uh, being a place where they wouldn't be judged, where they'd be accepted. So I was getting all these little bits of text about these different personalities, a drag queen and a, a young homeless rent boy and all these things. and. Already at that point, I was starting to get inspired by just a few sentences I'd read. So by the time I received it, I was reading this text and immediately knowing exactly the kind of orchestration I wanted for each of the different characters. You know, how do you orchestrate a drag queen? You know, that was <laughs> one of the most fun things to even think about. Um, so I was inspired within seconds, within seconds of reading it. Now, this is the first ever opera uh, in New York City or ever to have a, tra a transgender role written for a tran transgender performer, correct? Yes. Or singer, excuse when me. I, when I started on the libretto, I thought it was important to um, honor Sylvia P. Johnson and Sylvia, sorry, sorry, Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera. 
um, who were, were probably arrived at Stonewall a little bit late in that evening. Sometimes they're accredited with throwing the first rock. Um, but I thought it was important to um, honor transgender people in this story. But I thought it was also equally important that it be played by a transgender person. And Ian was totally on board with that right away. And um, we found one, you know, who sings the role beautifully. And it is the first um, opera by a major opera company to commission uh, a work that features a transgender role uh, sung by a transgender, written for a transgender person. Was that, uh, I mean, oftentimes when we talk about inclusion and we talk about writing roles for the people who can play them, oftentimes you hear creators or you hear the uh, upper, the higher power say, well, it's just too hard to find these people. They don't exist. Was it hard for you in any way to find a transgender opera singer? It's, it's difficult. Um, I wrote an opera called As One, which was actually written for two cisgender performers. So I've been very aware of this uh, for a couple of years. Uh, it's not easy because um, the training for transgender singers is way behind the curve right now. It's just catching up. We're just starting to understand how the voice can be adapted when the gender changes. Wow. I'm sorry, when the gender is realized. Yes. Uh, wow. I I'm wondering, uh, but it's also the opera community is fairly small, I would imagine, as well. I'm assuming it's not that easy to find performers of all different stripes and sizes all the time, is it? Um, I I'm of the mind that you just do a little work and it is easy. Oh. Um, I, we have a role, um, Carlos uh, is a Dominican school teacher um, who's just been fired from his job for being gay. And I the said- character. Yeah, a character, sorry. And I said, we need to find a Latin performer to do this. I mean, it's, it's not that hard. Um, and, and I have to say, when I went into the rehearsal room for the first time and saw our full cast and our course, it made me very happy. Usually when I write an opera and I go into the rehearsal, there are a lot of white people there. Yeah. Um, in this case, it's, it's full rainbow. You know, I have to ask, is, is this, uh, I mean, I'm sure over the course of your career, you've written operas prior or worked on operas prior that featured characters who, were of, who, who weren't necessarily white but were potentially played by white people. Have you learned something in the last few years or over the course of your career that made you feel compelled to have to do this, especially in regards to Stonewall? Well, Stonewall, you, you would have to do that with Stonewall because it's telling the truth. It was not... Um, I'm a white gay man, but I'm not going to take credit for what happened at Stonewall. Um, it was not a white gay male uprising. Everyone was involved. And the story of this opera, and I think Ian and I really agreed on this early on, is that this is about a group of diverse people who came together, who united, and said, we're not taking this anymore. It's not one person. It's not the white guy. It's not the black woman. It's not the trans person. It's that they all came together and said, we're not doing this anymore. And that's what is so powerful about this story to me. It's not about one person. It's about a group of people. Yeah. And how do, you, how do you adapt that into music? You take his libretto, and then you write the music. How do you make something that is, I imagine, at one, at one point classically opera, yeah. and it feels very much like an opera, but also feels like contextualized for this time period as well for an audience right now? Yeah, well, what I was really able to do was, although it is, a, as you say, classical opera, we have a fully, um, a full symphonic orchestra in the pit. We have a full chorus of performers who are sung without a mic. But what I did really love doing in this piece was kind of giving a bit of a wink and a nod to music from the late 60s. So although you are hearing a fully uh, acoustic orchestra playing, there are things that really sound like riffs. You know, we have real riffs, we have harmonic progressions. How do you define a riff? Well, a riff would be a short passage of music generally in the bass or in the lower section of the orchestra. Okay. Like a guitar riff. Like a guitar riff. Or a bass, yeah, You know, that kind of, you know, something that, a groove, a groove. So we have Veronata the drag queen, as she's getting ready for her debutante night out. We have some real grooving. Um, I love talking to an opera man about rock music. It's, a, it's like a riff, a groove. A groove, oh yes, and A sharp major. <laughs> no, we, we, I was really able to kind of run with that and in a way that I wouldn't normally be able to, in a way that wouldn't normally be contextually acceptable. Um, and also we hear chord progressions, so you know the harmonies. In this are more referencing what you would have heard harmonically at the time. So there are lots of references to music from the time, but still with my own kind of sound. So that was, that was a joy. Now you, uh, you referenced that uh, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia, like whether or not they threw the brick, you know, it's obviously stuff like that is ambiguous and people are debating it all the time. When it comes to that, when it comes to the moment in time in your Stonewall, when you're writing it, how do you give 
equal uh, weight to everybody who was there while at the same time not, I mean, there has to be a catalyst in that moment. So how do you give equal weight to people who believe different things about the, well, about the there, night? There is a catalyst, and it is a butch lesbian named Maggie who mm. throws the first punch. But as soon as she does that, she joins arms. Our brilliant director, Lenny Folia, has staged this in such a way that as soon as she starts protesting, being arrested, others grab her arms and, and join with her. And, and so it becomes a group. Um, I, you know, this is not a docu-opera. This is, a, this is not a real is that a thing? Uh, no, it's not okay. that I know of. I just made it up. Um, but it's, it's not a reenactment of Stonewall. Right. We're not doing that. It is a story that we have created, music and text, that imagines the spirit of Stonewall and imagines what was going on that night that led to all of these people banding together and fighting against oppression. It's, um, I don't even mention the name Stonewall in the libretto at all. We don't, we don't even mention the word Stonewall. Why is that? because I didn't feel it was necessary. Everyone knows what club this is. And I think if you do that, it becomes uh, like specific to a time that we don't, then it becomes a docu-opera and it raises um, expectations for an audience. And also people don't sit inside the bar that they're in, naming exactly the bar right. that they're exactly. in over and you, over and over again. Or do you say, oh, I need to dance tonight. I'm going to Stonewall. You say, I'm going to my favorite club and I can't wait to hear that jukebox. So was there, I mean, when, when we're talking about this and we're talking about it not being a, a, a docu-opera, which I just love the idea of now, uh, did you still feel a sort of, a, a lot of pressure when it came to telling this, it's 50 year anniversary, telling the story of Stonewall? It was a duty to tell what not may, may not be the historical truth, but the lived truth. So everything that we see our characters going through as they're making their way, all 10 of them, gets woven like a tapestry as they're making their way to Stonewall. Everything they went through, is something that people at that time went through. And I think that was what we were really, really keen on showing, this an idea of a lived truth rather than an historical truth, because these things happen and still happen. How do you define a, a lived truth? Just out of curiosity. Well, it's, that would be something. So for instance, th this piece opens uh, with Maggie, the character he just mentioned, get, getting abuse held at her in, on public transport. Two weeks ago in London, a lesbian yes. couple yep. was beaten up for not kissing in front of a group of straight men. That's a lip This happened. Although, obviously, this happened two weeks ago. We started writing the opera 18 months ago. These are the kind of things that are happening to our community then and now. And that's I think, gives us license to tell this story in this guise. I, I, I think the sad part of this story is that we're still fighting these fights. Um, look at what um, the current Orange administration is doing to transgender rights right now. They're eviscerating. He, I, I can't even say that he's doing it because I don't think that he even knows what he's doing. But his government is eviscerating transgender rights. It's, it's really horrible. And I'm worried that marriage equality will be next. Both Ian and I are married to men, very happily married. And um, if, if that's taken away from me, um, I don't see any reason to, to remain in this country. Uh, it's, it's, it was given to us. We earned it. We deserve it. And when I think about the privilege of telling this story, I'm, um, I've inherited something really terrific um, from these people who, fo who, who pushed away, who fought that evening, um, in that I'm able to marry the person I love, something that every straight person is able to do without even questioning it. So if that's taken away, I don't know what to do. So this opera is actually really important. It occurred at a time when people were fighting. I think we're still fighting. God, I mean, you know, I read that story about the women on the, on the bus in London. I went, this is what happened to our character Maggie in the first scene. She's harassed on the subway by a man who just calls her a really bad name. And then she goes to the police and the police laugh at her and say, well, look, look at you. You know, you look like a lesbian. What do you expect? That was happening in 1969, it's still happening today. And we should talk a little bit about what, I mean, for those who don't know what was happening at Stonewall at the time or at this bar, which was essentially that the police were harassing the patrons of the, of the bar. It was essentially, uh, forgive me for not knowing exactly, it was essentially Ill illegal, right, to be homosexual in public at the time? Yes, Basically. I mean, there were so many <laughs> arcane laws. For example, if you're dancing with another man, right. you know, like you could be arrested for that. Uh, Maggie gets arrested at the bar because she's not wearing three articles of women's clothing. They were all means with which to yeah, harass and harass. shake down the gay That's community. Exactly yeah. right. You know, they found convenient ways to put, you know, a lesbian in a paddy wagon.
Uh, and that's all it was. And, and she makes a very bad joke about having to wear three articles of women's clothing. There is something I want to mention is that there is humor in this opera. It's not all just human rights and anger and rage. There's a lot of humor because for me, being a gay man of a certain age and being around, one thing that I'm proudest of in my community is that we have a pretty good sense of humor. We're able to make fun of ourselves. We've had to. Can you expand on that a little bit? No, I probably can't. I just said it, and now I don't know what I mean. Um, no, I know. Uh, I, I mean, I, I know you what you agree mean, with me on that. Important. What about that? I don't think it's for me to agree with you. I know. But... Oh God, that was good. Um, <laughs> I think that we, because I mean, any. I think humor is used as a form of defense by yes, any absolutely. population that any are, marginalized that are... community has to protect. And themselves. that's our armor, yeah. and be it be that then manifest through our performance arts like drag, or in our lives just chatting with our friends and just literally ripping the whatever out of each other, we develop a sense of humor. And, and I think that that is shown in this piece. When you have a scene with two drag queens getting ready, we have a scene <laughs> with, with uh, a girl that's just an escapee from a conversion therapy center, mm. yapping on about her, her girlfriend's um, ditzy ways. I mean, we've, we've, just, <laughs> we've just got all, all, all manner of lovely people yeah. that, that all that night descent, decided to go to a place where they weren't being judged. The water wasn't running. The, 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 the glasses were washed in kind of a, 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 tub. a tub of dirty water. This wasn't a place we want to go. It wasn't an aspirational place, but it was a place where they could go and be themselves. And, and that's what we have in this. And, and that sense of, oh, I can release. I can just relax and be me is what pervades the first act particularly. Was it tough to inject humor into the story as well? Or did you find that that came quite naturally? That's just, that's what I do. I mean, like, I, I, I love these characters so much. And for me to, to love a character, I have to find their sense of humor um, and what they can find in themselves that's funny. Uh, I don't think it's possible to really love another human being or another character without knowing that they have a sense of humor about themselves. Yeah, especially if, if, when it comes to drama. And I think it's very important for this story because it could come off as, as self-important and political dogma, um, unless there's just a human quality to these people. And, they're, and I, I love them all. I mean, the main, I, well, I don't love the police officers, um, but, and, and there's one closeted man named Edward that I'm not very fond of, um, but uh, even Troy, in his own way. He's a go-go dancer. He's an ex yeah, extorting go-go yeah. dancer. Yeah, he's an extorting... Poor guy is going to be wearing gold hot pants in Act 2. Yeah. <laughs> Just that. And we found an opera singer with a body to do that. Um, <laughs> um, it's... Uh, even him... I mean, like, there's an element of survival in New York City at the time. I've been in... I've been a... Uh, I've lived in city over in this city over 40 years and also mostly live downtown. I mean, I've lived in the West Village or the East Village. I only live a few blocks away from... Stonewall. So I just know these characters and I love them. That's all. Yeah. I have a question coming in uh, from Twitter. It's, uh, hey guys, how do you mentally prepare before a show, especially a show that is this historic and powerful? Well, we don't know if it's historic and powerful yet, um, but... Uh, <laughs> well, it's historic. Yes. Or it's I guess so, yeah, it is, based. on many levels. Yeah. Um, well, I think... It at, alcohol. At that point... <laughs> <laughs> <For me. laughs> Once the show's up at and that, going... Not for him. Not at for that point... Our work's been done. I, I did my work six months ago, and I have to have faith that then that the performers that have been engaged to do their job do their job. Yeah, I kind of sit in my seat thinking, please don't forget your lines, please don't forget your lines, which has happened. And you get that hot and cold sweat that comes at the same time. We think, no, you were meant to sing then. And you kind of want to stand up and join. No, she was meant to say. But no, it's a question of just sitting beside your husband and just holding their hand and going, oh, have deep breaths. Deep I think the best thing you can do in these moments is just say, you did this. You created this. This story was not there. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the audience is following it and loving it. We don't know. I think they will love it, but, but you never know going in. The important thing is to, is to find a way to cherish it. Because it's a terrific privilege to be able to tell this story, to get a commission from a major opera company like New York City Opera. And they've put really so much work into this that you just should be appreciative. Yeah. Uh, a couple questions from our audience. Who has a question? Right here. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> hi. Um, I have a question from our website, buildseries.com, and it's what message do you hope sticks with the audience after watching and experiencing Stonewall? That, that together as a community, whatever community you are, we can overcome 
we can find the strength within ourselves to stand up in, with a sense of community and, and our voice will be heard. I think that's, that's what I feel. Great question. I have nothing to add to that. That's the most eloquent statement I could ever come up with. Thank you. One more. Wait. Oh, we're done. We don't have any more questions. Oh, okay. Wow. Thanks. Um, guys, I'm so looking forward to seeing Stonewall. It opens uh, this Friday, June 21st, right at New York City Opera. I cannot wait to see it. Congratulations on Thank the you work so that you've Thank you done. Much. And uh, for having us here. Good luck opening night, guys. Yeah. You're not going to need it. It's going to go incredibly. Give them a round of applause for being hey, here. Let's hear it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.